Hey, Will Lawson, uh, uh, so Will got his PhD from Davis, right? Yep. Uh, a few years ago. Um, and I think uh, after that he got a postdoc at Livermore, right? That's right. And he was in there the whole time. And now yeah, you're something in staff. Yeah, he's something bigger than a postdoc now, so he's a staff member at uh, Livermore. Um, so Will um, works on a lot of interesting topics. He works on galaxy clusters. Um, he, as he'll probably tell you, found a good collaboration to search for uh, Merging galaxy clusters like the infamous bullet cluster, which everybody knows and loves, right, in the scene many times in their lives. So, um, so he's leading a large collaboration to study these types of systems. Um, more recently, he's uh, gotten into uh, microlensing and primordial black hole dark matter, and it sounds like you're going to talk about all of that <laughs> here and today more. and more <laughs> in all the span of one hour. So, <laughs> take notes. Okay, uh, thanks. About uh, 10 minutes for questions? Is that... Yeah, more or less. Okay, all right, sounds good. And feel free to interject with questions throughout the yeah, other. Um, well, also one thing I wanted to point out is that I got a few things in common with your benefactor Mitchell here, and so I got my bachelor's in science in maritime systems engineering from Texas A&M Galveston. So I'm a, a CIE. <laughs> Uh, I also I worked in the oil industry for six years. This was me on one of the uh, cell spars that I helped design. I don't have everything in common. I wasn't the valedictorian of my class, nor was I the captain of the tennis team. But, uh, there's that. Now, as Lee mentioned, uh, I co-founded this merging cluster collaboration, and if I were giving a normal science talk, I would pick uh, any one of these paper or some selection thereof and give you a, a very detailed scientific talk about that. But I've been thinking a lot um, about something else lately, and so I wanted to I wanted to give this shot, give this a try. Uh, this is a new talk. It's very much a rough, uncut diamond. I think there's a diamond underneath there. Um, so forgive me. I probably would have given a more traditional talk had I known I was being recorded beforehand. But uh, anyways, I want to talk about a concept uh, today, which is null bias. And, and before we get into that, I think it's, it's really a form of pathological science. And so I wanted to review this concept of pathological science. I'll introduce uh, the concept of null bias and, and do that as we go along. And I'll talk about some, some of my um, experience with it as I've witnessed it in the in emerging galaxy uh, constraints on self-interacting dark matter. And then also how I've, uh, how I've witnessed it recently as I've, as I've gotten into this field of intermediate mass uh, black hole dark matter. And, and so, again, uh, forgive me, uh, this is the first time giving this talk. Uh, hopefully, uh, I, I fear that it may be too pedantic. Uh, that's not the intent. I don't mean to insult anyone by telling you something that maybe you already know. Uh, but I, I see that it's it keeps coming up in every field that I've looked at in detail, so I think it's, it's worth talking about. Now, uh, whenever I was at UC Davis, the, the best single lesson that I ever had came from Tony Tyson. And in one class, in a signal to noise, he devoted it to this concept of pathological science. And this term was first coined by Irving Langmuir uh, uh, back in 1953. I really recommend, if you're not familiar with it, to look in detail at this uh, Physics Today article. There's a nice article on it. But really, it's, this, uh, it's defined as this psychological process in which a scientist, originally conforming to the scientific method, unconsciously veers from that method and begins a pathological process of wishful data interpretation. So this isn't people going out and being um, deceitful or deceptive and publishing false results uh, on purpose. They actually allow themselves to be fooled. And so it really is a psychological or pathological process where, where a well-intentioned scientist can, can go out and uh, veer from the scientific method. Now, uh, Langmuir uh, noted that there are typical features of pathological science uh, where this seems to come up again and again. And it's all outlined in, in his paper, and you can find the old talk that he gave. Um, but really, there's some, there's some key effects, and so key cases where you really see this. And so, one, whenever the maximum effect is, barely, uh, is by a barely perceptible cause. And then he noted that oftentimes, uh, it's the case that the effect doesn't scale linearly uh, uh, with, the, 
uh, cause. And also, the effect only happens sometimes when the conditions are just right. You can't quite nail down exactly when those conditions are right. It might not be entirely repeatable. Uh, of course, the effect is always close to the limit of detectability, and uh, there are often claims of great, great accuracy, well beyond the state of, of the art, or what one might expect, and so maybe uh, uncertainty uh, characterization isn't done correctly. And then there are oftentimes fantastic theories contrary to experience are suggested, so sometimes this is also uh, maybe fringe science. And then, um, really, criticisms are met by ad hoc excuses uh, at the spur of the moment. And, and so, now, as you'll notice, I mean, uh, and as Tony Tyson pointed out in his class, a single hit along that checklist doesn't necessarily mark an idea as pathological. And so if we go back to this, right, I mean, most of the interest in science is actually taking place close to the limit of detectability. I mean, you're always searching for something new, you're always doing that. Um, fantastic theories, I mean, we've had many of these, dark energy is, it qualifies as this. And so just checking off one or two of these isn't necessarily a problem. Oftentimes, good science checks off a few of these items. It's really... Um, a process of checking off many of those items. And so well, that's exactly. And so there's always a risk in undertaking experiments and interpreting them. Okay, but there's also great opportunities. So you shouldn't shy away from, from uh, checking off a few of those things. And this really influenced my entire career. And so I really, after this, I decided to. Uh, so every time I, I formulated a project, I would base it on a twist of John Wheeler's radical conservatism. And so I, I said, okay, I left engineering, I left a secure job in engineering because I wanted to go and pursue the fundamental uh, frontiers of, of physics. That's what really excited me. Uh, so I, was, I wasn't going to compromise that. I was still going to have a radical goal, uh, high risk, high reward, potentially revolutionary science because that's what excited me. But I was going to make sure that I always had a conservative goal or goals associated with that project. Uh, these are lower risk goals, typically less of an extrapolation from uh, the secure base of, of scientific knowledge. And this way, it was kind of a, an insurance, a psychological insurance uh, plan for me. Because if you just go for this, you might be tempted. Uh, you've got all your eights in one basket. If you fail, you might lose everything. You might have to leave the, the scientific field. But if you've always got some interest in conservative science, you can really not force yourself into, into falling into these pathological traps, which are hard to identify at times. And now, there are many ways to do science. I'm not saying that this is, uh, <laughs> this is the only way, but it's, it's one way that I found to be quite successful and interesting. Now, don't confuse conservative science with boring science. In fact, whenever I created the Merging Cluster Collaboration, I created it um, because I was primarily interested in testing whether or not dark matter self-interacted, whether or not there was a new fundamental dark force. Um, but I, I said, that's definitely high risk, high reward. It's probably not. It's probably self-interacting dark matter. is probably as unlikely as any other dark matter theory we currently have. Um, but I wanted to form a conservative set of goals that could be accomplished with the same experiment. And so for the merging uh, cluster collaboration, um, with these merging galaxy clusters, you can use them to study uh, higher energy, particle acceleration, uh, galaxy um, evolution, and various other science cases. And so sometimes uh, you might be surprised, but you, it turns out that you get some of the most exciting science out of these conservative goals. And this was a surprise to me whenever I started it out, but one of the most uh, interesting results to come out of this merging cluster collaboration was that um, we found kind of the missing link between particle acceleration and, and clusters. And so this is basically the, the Lucy of, of particle acceleration, where we found that there's this big uncertainty about how shocks and clusters re-accelerate uh, particles up to potentially ultra-relativistic velocities. And, and you can't do this just from a thermal pool. Uh, and we were finding that was the case. And so there is this argument that, well, maybe you have uh, relativistic particles being ejected from AGN. 
those get excited, they lose some of their energy, and then you have a shock propagate through, and through diffusive shock acceleration or very sort of mechanism that re reaccelerates this. And so this was this was a really exciting uh, science that came out of this, and, and it was on the uh, the cover of the inaugural issue of Nature Astronomy, and so I'm pretty proud of that. So this is just to say that conservative science doesn't have to be boring science. And so I was really inspired by this, and so this is a, a bit of an homage to, to Irving. This talk is an homage to, to Irving's talk about pathological science, and I wanted to talk about null bias. This is a concept. Um, and it's a form of pathological science, but it's a form, it's a concept that I've been seeing more and more in every detailed field that I've looked at. And so, really, this is the tendency to overstate the constraining power of a null result due to a psychological process in which a scientist originally conforming to the scientific method unconsciously appears from that method. And, um, begins a pathological process of, of wishful or, or careless data interpretation. And so uh, this is something that I, I haven't heard talked about. People may be familiar with it, but as I've done a literature review, I haven't seen anyone really mention this. And I usually call that confirmation bias, except in this case it's a little result. Yeah, that's right. It can be confirmation bias. Yeah, it's a definitely a form of confirmation bias. But there are some differences, so it's a little bit there's some aspects and some features that are different, and, and we can talk about it more as we go through. And I highlight some of those features. But yeah, you'll see overlap because, again, all these are forms of basically pathological science. Now, I felt it was important to talk about this because null bias is potentially more damaging than false positives. We often devote a lot of attention to false positives, um, uh, false detections. But really, null bias can be even more damaging, and it can retard scientific progress more uh, than these false positives. And this is because, really, again, it's, it's psychological. Null results aren't sexy science, right? If someone has gone out and they've claimed uh, that a region of parameter space is ruled out, it's not that exciting to go back and, and verify that with a, with a similar experiment. And, I mean, it's just, you can look at it. I mean, there's terminology, null results, are oftentimes called negative results versus positive results whenever you have positive detection. So it's just prevalent. I mean, it's, it's understandable, um, uh, but it, it exists. And then, I mean, you can ask yourself, how many null results get as thorough of a systematics investigation as the opera faster than like neutrinos? And this quickly, right? I mean, this, this false detection came out Everyone went very detailed looking at every possible systematic, and it came down to like timing and wires. And so, how often do, do null results get that same systematics check? I don't think it's very, very often. And so, I mean, sure, there's an overall cost uh, of diversion from false positives, but the delay is relatively um, uh, short lived. And so, similar to Langmuir's talk, I want to talk about some of the features of, of null bias and, and what typically exists. When, when do you find null bias and, and what are the common features associated with that? And, and oftentimes, where I've seen it, it's been involved with fringe science. So whenever you've got a, a null result, and this is uh, constraining some fringe science, and this is especially the case whenever you have a pre prevailing alternative theoretical model, um, despite lack of confirmation. And as I'm going to talk about, um, self-interacting dark matter uh, is, is that. And then this, this is because there's kind of this false sense of a safety net, uh, sometimes leading to a lack of rigor. Right? You already say, oh, well, it's probably this other theory. Um, I'm ruling out this, this theory. And so, you know, uh, if, if you've got everyone saying, well, it's likely this, then you feel okay ruling out that, and so it can lead to, to bias. And then also, you typically see it where there's small sample size. And this is because, um, just like anything else, whenever you've got a small sample size, it's typically easier to miss systematic errors, which can lead to a bias. And so, I'm gonna talk some about this, but where one example of, of where we've seen this in the past is related to self-interacting dark matter, the constraint on self-interacting dark matter with merging galaxy clusters. And so 
some of the seminal work came out of Markovich et al. Um, 2004, where, as Louis mentioned, they used the bullet cluster to constrain the scattering cross section of, um, of dark matter. Now, just historically, the time was around 2004. When dark matter was at its height of popularity, it's become a little less popular uh, recently. Uh, but a self-interacting dark matter, especially scattering self-interacting dark matter, was definitely fringe. Uh, there weren't any workshops on the subjects. There were very few papers. A lot of that's changed since. Um, and then also you get the small sample size. So the bullet cluster was only known was the only known dissociative merger for a number of years. And I'm going to talk about the, some of the papers and in particular Markovich et al. So they were relatively conservative whenever they came up with their constraints, and they said, look. We're not going to try to estimate uncertainties. We're only going after order of magnitudes. It was the first paper to do this. They introduced some concepts, and, and all was well and good. Randall et al. 2008 was uh, not as conservative, and they, they collected a number of systematics, which I'll talk about. And this led to, to a null bias. And I just want to give a disclaimer uh, that while I'm going to critique these works, there have been few works that have been influenced my career as, as positively as these, and I've collaborated with with most of these other co-authors, and I think very highly of them. So it's not to not to um, speak poorly of their work. It's just what I'm most familiar with. And so uh, let me give you a little bit of a background on how you constrain dark matter with merging galaxy clusters, because this will help understand how you can uh, lead to some null bias. Um, and so here's a typical merging scenario, and I'm going to have a little uh, movie on my simulator, so this is the best you can do. Well, we've got, uh, I'll show dark matter. These are two galaxy clusters. You've got one that's going to end up on the north and one that's going to end up on the southern side there. Um, but they've, just like any galaxy cluster, they've got about 85% uh, dark matter. Whenever you see it alone, it'll be blue. Uh, about 15% gas and a small fraction of the, uh, of the mass is actually in the, in the galaxies themselves, which are shown as black dots here. And whenever you have dark matter and gas overlapping, it's shown as with purple. Now, in a typical galaxy cluster merger, you've got gravitational attraction, so they accelerate towards one another, they speed up, they eventually collide. Um, and this is where things start to get interesting, because uh, they, the galaxies, there's so much space in between them, they act as effectively collisionless particles. The gas, however, is much more uniformly distributed, and so you can get um, alpha and scattering and other forces which act as a, which act to slow it down. And so the gas becomes dissociated from the dark matter and the effectively collisionless galaxies. And so the dark matter is also effectively collisionless compared to the, to the gas. And so by studying the separation of these three components, you can study, uh, you can start to constrain uh, the dark matter cross-section. So one, uh, just from the fact that you see that the that the dark matter, whenever you measure its location via gravitational lensing, is more where the collisionless galaxies are and less where the gas is, you can actually can compare the dark matter scattering cross-section with that of the gas and come up with a constraint on the, on the cross-section, uh, the scattering cross-section of dark matter. And so this was done in Markovich et al. 2004. This is relatively straightforward. It doesn't give you the tightest constraint, though. Um, you could also look at how uh, how uh, these subclusters slow down, and so if if they did, and you can compare the observed velocity with the free fall velocity. Now, if you if you do that and you see that they slow down significantly, then you might say that there was a dark matter uh, scattering cross section. All right. You can also compare the mass to light ratio of the subclusters. And so, for example, um, if they start off with initial mass to light ratio, then after the merger, if dark matter is scattered out of the halo due to interactions, then whenever you compare the mass to light ratio of the, um, of the resulting clusters, you would see that there's a lower mass to light ratio. Uh, and then also you've got the galaxy uh, in dark matter also. So the galaxies are effectively collisionless. They're only really experiencing um, gravitational forces. 
and so if the dark matter experience is something other than gravitational forces, then what you'll see is you'll actually see an offset between the centers of the galaxy population and the center of the dark matter um, location. And so um, Markovich et al. introduced the first three methods, and then Randall et al. introduced this fourth method. And they, this, uh, this last method, for example, comparing the locations, as I mentioned, was studied by Randall et al. in 2008. And so they compared the locations of the galaxies um, as measured from uh, Hubble Space Telescope imaging, and then the location of the lensing uh, peak also as measured from, um, from Hubble Space Telescope, the gravitational lensing measurements. They then did an in-body simulation where they, they modeled the bullet cluster, they modeled the mass of the two halos, they then had um, particles where they changed the dark matter cross-section and reran the collision um, again and again, and so they mapped out what was the projected dark matter galaxy offset as they change the um, dark matter cross-section. And so, not surprisingly, as the dark matter cross-section increases, the offset becomes greater. And so then they, they said, okay, well, let us look at the observed uh, bullet cluster galaxy dark matter offset, which was 5.7 plus or minus 6.6 .6 arc seconds. And they said, okay, given this, we can put an upper limit on the scattering cross-section because um, Basically, you add these two numbers together and see, okay, well, it didn't, it didn't scatter by more than that, and so uh, we can constrain up to about 1.2. It's got to be less than 1.2 centimeters per square per gram. Now, this is, this is interesting because um, really one way to do it instead, if you, and if you were doing a typical measurement, and this is just kind of a hint, Right, the, at some of this bias that was there, if you're doing this experiment, you would say, okay, well, my best fit model, if you actually look at the offset, is 0.8 centimeters squared per gram, but it's consistent with zero. So you can say, but this was never mentioned. It was only saying an upper limit. And so this is fine, and I understand why, but it's, it's just a hint. I mean, at the time, self-interacting dark matter wasn't, wasn't there, and, and the, measurement uncertainties were large, and so it's reasonable just to report the, the offset, but it, you could have some mention that, that actually we did observe an offset, and it's trailing, it's in the correct direction that you might expect, right? And so, but this, this wasn't mentioned, again, because, you know, self-interacting dark matter isn't really a thing, and so it's just, just go with the safer interpretation. And so, so again, this suffered from it was fringe science, it was a small sample size, there was only one cluster. But then, um, we also, another feature of null bias is that you often have qualitative rather than quantitative support to your assumptions. And so, uh, this was the case in, in Randall et al. as well. Because, you just think about projection effects, right? So, what you're observing in this case is actually the projected offset of the galaxies in the dark matter. But what's important is the physical offset of those two, right? And so what Randall et al. did was they said, okay, well, you know, we can, we can highly define this, uh, this shot cone, and if it were in the plane of the sky, we wouldn't be able, if, if the merger were occurring along the line of sight, we wouldn't be able to observe this well-defined shot cone. And so since we can resolve it so well, it's got to be in the plane of the sky. And so seems like a reasonable assumption, oftentimes these are. Um, but really, there was nothing to support this. There was no saying, oh, well, given how well we can resolve this and based on simulations, we find that it can't be more than, than 30 degrees. And so, actually, whenever I investigated um, this angle of inclination, so zero is if it's occurring in the plane of the sky, um, and so taking into account all the uncertainties modeling assumptions, I found that, okay, well, the best fit was kind of more around 20, 20 degrees angle of inclination. But that changes the results. That changes the constraints, and it actually loosens them. Um, and because you can get your tightest constraints from a merger actually in the plane of the sky. But as you can see, 
um, whenever you actually took what evidence there was and what, you, what, it, what it would allow you to do, there was still some uncertainty on this. And none of this uncertainty was propagated forward. And so this is another feature of, of null bias, is uncertainty characterization or propagation is rarely done correctly or thoroughly. And you can understand this, right? Again, you've got um, combined with the fact that it's French science and you don't think that it's really probably the correct um, scientific result to begin with, this takes a lot of work. And so, you know, maybe you don't have to go through with this investment. And so it's, it's natural not to go through this. Now, and I can confirm that it takes a lot of work because some of these, some of these systematics we're just now characterizing. And so I was working with a graduate student, UC Davis, Karen N. And another thing that they did was that they were unrealist, unrealistically small centroid uncertainties from the measurement of both the, the galaxies and the dark matter. Also from observations and simulations. And some of these go back to Marusha's products work in 2006, who I also collaborated with and think very highly of. Um, but what we did was we went to the illustrious simulation, and there we had many more particles, and we said, okay, let us compare how well we can measure the galaxy centroid um, and compare that with the, the true dark matter centroid, and what's the typical scatter in that? And so whenever you use the same centroid measurement estimate that uh, Randall et all used, we find that that the scatter can be on the orders of, of tens to hundreds of kiloparsecs. Now keep in mind that the, the offset as measured by Marusha uh, was 60 kiloparsecs, right? And so, so the fact is, is that there's far more uncertainty in these measurements than, than was let on. Now this is a bit depressing for people like me who want to use galaxy clusters to constrain dark matter because there's a lot more scatter and just intrinsic scatter can, and so that limits how well you can do. In fact, in this paper we showed that you can't really place a, a very meaningful constraint with just one merger. It's got to be with an ensemble of mergers, which I'll, I'll talk about. How well do you trust the lustrous when you're assuming lustrous is reality? And it's not. I mean, it's, it's, it's a simulation, it's got baryons, it's got hydrodynamics, there's all sorts of mistakes that you can too. So, how do you yeah. take that into account in, in this analysis? Yeah, that's a very good point. And so one, one check that we did was we said, okay, well, let's, let's take it to kind of an extreme and say that forget the galaxies and let's just look at uh, dark matter subhalos and assume that, okay, those are our galaxies and, and then use those as a, as a tracer of the centroid as well. And so we got reasonable, a reasonable, reasonable comparison. But yeah, you're right. I mean, this was... This in itself is prone with many systematics. And the way that we proposed it in the paper was that this is kind of like a maybe best as you can do type scenario. And it might even be underestimating the uncertainty. But there, the point of this exercise was really to put kind of this floor, like assuming optimistically how well you can do. But even it has bias that we, that we admit. And so, right, because a Lystris is a relatively small simulation, you don't have some of the more massive clusters that you see in some of these others. And like you said, there's other astrophysics, which we know, in some cases, they got wrong. For example, the AGN feedback was too large in many of the illustrious simulations. And so there's, yes, I agree. So what we tried to do was point out those systems. But those simulations also, they look at the way the universe is. They, they, make, they take semi-empirical relationships and adjust the models so they look like the universe. And so they also are putting a bias into what their final is, right? That's right. And so that's, that was really worrisome when people compare to these, these simulations, is that simulations don't sit apart in pure theoretical space. They're actually trying to model what they've already seen. And so it's the only thing you have, but it's just hard to include those errors in, in, um, in your analysis. And I really I like the fact that you did look into it by using subtables. That's a, that's a very good way of doing it. No, I agree. And I mean, Unfortunately, systematics are, are going to be in every experiment. And so I think that the best that you can do is, is try to admit uh, where you failed to account for systematics so that at least you're not overclaiming a particular result. And at best, try to, try to approximate or come up with various other uh, null tests or, or unit tests. 
But that's a very good point. And uh, related to this mass to light ratio of the, of the clusters, this was actually what Randall and all got the title constraint from. They kind of made the assumption that, okay, well, you start off with an initial mass to light ratio. The observed mass to, mass to light ratio is in line kind of with what we expect to see. But if you really look at the mass to light ratio in clusters, there's a huge amount of scatter. I mean, you've got um, order of magnitude amounts of scatter just in the observed mass to light ratio in clusters. And so uh, this wasn't considered. And once you factor this in, you don't really have a, a secure result uh, by looking at the mass to light ratio of only the end state. And so another feature that you typically see associated with null bias is, um, is it's oftentimes complex to go from measurement to constraint, right? Uh, so science works because uh, just as any accurate as the Kevin Bacon, any measurement is to a given physical constraint, right? This is why science works so well, is, is basically there's six degrees of separation or, or, or fewer between a particular measurement and, and some other related topic uh, or some other related physical process in science. Right, and, and this is why our whole body of, of, of knowledge is so secure and works so well. But it also means that you can get pretty extended whenever you're making some of these constraints. And so also just the, the physics involved, you can deal with, you can have many astrophysical um, complexities, uh, potential systematics. And you have to realize that every degree of separation is introducing uh, its own forms of systematics. And so every time you're taking a step away from the direct thing that you're constraining, you're introducing systematics. And every time you introduce systematics, it introduces the, the potential for a bias, and in this case, a null bias. And so, for example, uh, this separation for the dark matter uh, scatter and cross section here. It's a, this separation D between the galaxies and the dark matter is not just a function of the dark matter cross-section, but it's also a function of the, the velocity of the, the clusters at the time of collision and throughout the, the collision period, uh, the surface mass density of the dark matter, and it's a function of the time of the merger and all that. And so, so with mergers, it's, it's pretty hard in some sense because Really, this is what you've got. You've got some merger going on. You've got the plane of the sky that's going on with respect to that. But really, all you can measure is, is the mass of the two subclusters, uh, the line of sight velocity, the uh, um, spectroscopic measurements of the, the galaxies, and then the projected separation. All right, but that's not the physical parameters that you're really interested in here, and that's the three-dimensional separation uh, the velocity of the time of collision, and then the overall um, evolution of the, of the merger throughout time. And so one thing that, that we did to try to mitigate this and try to incorporate this and, and reduce this, this null bias that existed was, was come up with a forward model um, where we could propagate all of our uncertainty through to, um, to the measurement properties that really matter. And so we did this in, in 2000, well, I did this in 2013. And then you can see just from this small snippet of this, snippet of this parameter space that you end up with extremely uh, interesting covariances uh, between the different parameters. And all these were ignored because one, it was complex. And this, is, this was hard to do. Um, but whenever you do this, I mean, you find out that, that for example, this constraint using the slowing of the subclusters where you've got the observed versus the freefall velocity, and we compare the, the observed three-dimensional velocity, our constraint on that, with the time, the velocity at the time of collision, or the freefall velocity, basically. You see still a large amount of correlation and, and actually a large amount of spread in how well you can actually constrain these properties. Uh, I mean, all this is kind of just to say that mitigating null bias is hard. And, it's not particularly glamorous uh, science. Um, no, but I think that, that sometimes it can, it can prove that it's worth 
I'm not nearly as famous as, as Mark Avich or, or Scott Randall or others in the field. Um, and, and nor should I be. I mean, they were really the first to the field. And, but, but I think I, I wanted to just make this point and say that even though it's not glamorous, I think that other than being a good scientist and, and really investigating this, sometimes there can be unforeseen rewards. And so instead of just trusting the, the bullet cluster, I, I was particularly interested in emerging galaxy clusters. And so I went out and I tried to find another one. And so I did from the Deep Lens survey um, with, with that collaboration. And whenever I was going through and doing some of this detailed investigation, Originally, I came up with a constraint just by measuring where the gas was, the gas is here in the center, that, okay, it can only constrain the cross-section to be less than two centimeters squared per gram. This wasn't competitive with uh, the bullet cluster, and so it wasn't particularly exciting. I remember my collaborators being like, well, can't we do better than that? And, uh, and so then I started thinking, maybe we can. Uh, and so, what I found was actually there was a 20 arc second offset between the galaxy centroid and the lensing centroid. And the principal axis of that offset was highly in line with the uh, merger axis, so the, the, um, the axis to the other subcluster in the north. And then I started thinking, okay, well, I mean, what, how could this be? Because why would we see this offset in the basketball cluster and not in the bullet cluster? And so I had already done all this other work characterizing the uncertainty of dynamics. And so then I found that the musketball cluster was actually a much slower and older cluster. And I did some preliminary um, uh, analytic estimate to show that, oh, well, this is the offset that you would expect for the musketball cluster, and it's larger. Because as time progressive, progresses, the offset will grow as the, as the uh, clusters proceed outwards. And then eventually it'll come back and collapse. And this led to some very interesting simulation work by Felix Kalhofer et al. And actually they showed that, yeah, you would expect a larger offset for the musket ball cluster in some dark matter models than for the bullet cluster. But still, this was only two systems. And so this was, again, very prone to null bias. And so this led to me coming up with uh, ideas that Okay, well, we need to find many more of these mergers. We need to, because we're, we still have too many systematics in the, in the problem. And so this led to a whole new way of finding these major mergers and the emerging cluster collaboration and all those papers that I showed at the beginning. So, so a lot of positive stuff has come out from some of this rigor. Now, we weren't the only ones who had this idea of, um, of using an ensemble of clusters. And in fact, some of you may notice this nature paper from Harvey et al where they used an ensemble of mergers and put extremely tight constraints on the dark matter cross-section. Such tight constraints that it could no longer um, explain the self-interacting dark matter problem uh, that's seen in dwarf cores, etc. But I wanted to point out another feature of null bias. And this is uh, actually multiple existing null results. Typically, you would think that if you've got a null result and you come up with another one, that's good. This is good science, right? You're having an alternative to test. But there is this case where you can end up with a false safety net, where if someone else has already constrained this amount of parameter space, one, it can lead to a temptation to need to outdo the rest to make an impact. You've got to do better. And it also can lead to a false sense of, of safety because they've already ruled out this parameter space. So Maybe you don't have to be quite as rigorous if your result shows that you're already constraining that same amount of parameter space. And I, I, while I'm critiquing Harvey's work, um, he was extremely helpful in collaborating uh, after this paper to identify many of these systematics. And so, um, so again, this is more of a case of some pathological science uh, where you may, they made certain mistakes. For example, whenever estimating the galaxy location and comparing the offset of the galaxy and the dark matter location, they only use single band photometry. And so for example, for this galaxy cluster, whenever they calculated the offset, they found this galaxy, which is actually a foreground galaxy. And you can easily see that in color, was the center of the, the light profile instead of one of these BCGs. And so that was one case. Um, 
Another one was where they ignored other literature um, where they found a weak lensing peak that happened to coincide with the chip gap of uh, ACS. And so this was very much in disagreement with existing published literature. Uh, also uh, by multiple people uh, where we had independent results showing that, oh well, this actually, the mass piece seemed to coincide with the distribution of the gas. There's nothing there. Uh, and so this is just sort of things where, you know, there's systematics, they're hard to uncover in some cases, but in some cases you can get lazy if there's already null results there. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit, but if you're interested, we went back and, and corrected some of these results. And it can have a big impact once you, once you do. But they had a result around uh, like 0.5, it had to be less than 0.5, but whenever you correct for some of these, these other effects, what you find is that the result is actually more like two, to, it's gotta be less than two to two and a half centimeters squared per gram. And even then we, um, this is an approximation as we know in the paper because we didn't go back and do everything in their paper for first principles. Now we can do better because um, we can characterize some of these systems a bit better with radio relics, and if you're interested, I'd be happy to talk later, or you can check out some of those papers. But briefly, in the last 10 minutes here, I just wanted to talk about um, another topic which I've recently become extremely uh, interested in, and it's this uh, subject of intermediate mass black holes. Now, intermediate mass black holes I was a bit surprised. I mean, there's actually extensive literature, for example, on primordial black holes and other intermediate mass black holes going back to the 1970s when my collaborator, George Tapline, first posited in, in nature that uh, the primordial black holes could make up uh, the bulk of dark matter. He was thinking much smaller scales, um, um, but there's a huge amount of literature showing the black hole mass spectrum in a recent paper Nice review by Carr et al. And then, I mean, black holes have been detected in this mass range uh, of, of 10 to 10 to the 10 solar masses. And of course, everyone knows about the LIGO results. Um, not a lot of people realize it, but OVAL, uh, a microlensing experiment, uh, astronomy survey, has detected uh, about a 10 solar mass black hole. Recently, there's been claims of uh, 2,200 solar mass black holes. And, uh, is 47 tuck, and but this is a this is a field where this is what the field looked like whenever I was a graduate student circa 2008, and whenever I came, machos were completely ruled out. Right, you had you know the microlensing experiments from Macho, Erops, and Ogle really constrained out all this. You had um, the CMB constraints which completely ruled out this area, and then you had uh, also wide binaries, which ruled out that. And so, you know, whenever I was a graduate student, I assumed machos were dead, and so that was part of the reason that I went into things like self-interacting dark matter and, and various other constraints on dark matter. Um, and then, uh, but something interesting happened. And, and so, well, just, this is just to point out, and it's related to one of these other features. These constraints here, the CMB, they're many steps from you. There are complex assumptions and astrophysics involved going from the actual observations to the constraints on dark matter. The wide binaries, there were, you know, to begin with, small sample sizes. There were systematics not investigated. For example, they, they, it was, they didn't actually have spectra confirming binary pairs. It was all just um, imaging, and so you could have chance alignments. And, and actually, once people investigated, this is what the constraints look like circa 2016, uh, where people like Ali Mod and Kamenkowski reinvestigated some of the assumptions and astrophysics involved with the original CMB constraints. And they said, whenever we do a better job of doing this, actually the constraint gets put, pushed back for magnitudes. And in part of communication with Ostreicher, who was one of the co-authors on this Riccati et al. paper that ruled out this area, he, he said the limits that Riccati and I reached for black hole numbers were far too severe. Right? And then these wide binaries, people started going back and following up some of these 
pairs of galaxies and found, oh, well, you've got interlopers, and they introduce a bias. And once you correct for that, the white binary constraint shifts back. Now, one thing that I like about the Kamikowski and, and Ali Ahmad paper was that in their paper, they, at every step, they know where they're making a, a giant assumption. And they say, look, we can still only estimate like order of magnitudes type uncertainty on this because of the assumptions involved. And so I think that's fair science. There's always going to be systematics, but you have to be straightforward whenever you do this. Now, more recently, uh, there's been this constraint uh, by Brandt et al. And then Lee et al. also had a similar paper where they looked at dwarf galaxies. And they said, OK, well, if you had a population of large, massive black holes, monolithic population, then what would happen is they, uh, through gravitational uh, friction, would go to the center of these, of these dwarfs, causing the dwarfs to uh, kinetically heat up. And so they would be, it would change the profile of the stars in these dwarfs. But again, whenever you go and you look at the paper, there are a large number of complex assumptions in astrophysics involved. For example, um, there's no central massive black hole assumed. And Kiltzman et al., 2015, found that if you have a 2,200 solar mass black hole at the center of a star, oh, sorry, Kiltzman et al., we know that there are probably uh, Intermediate mass black holes at the center of these star clusters, and then we don't. I mean, that's not true. Come it's, on. They, there's okay. okay there's there's evidence. There's so many papers claiming that there are, and they've been shown. Many You're right. Shown many of them have been shown. That so the, the popular cluster in Andromeda probably has one. Forty-seven has one. So don't yeah, it's questionable. Questions. Okay, it's questionable. I will just say that you should at least include the possibility. Yes, absolutely. You should include the possibility of the existence of those to see what it does to your uncertainty. You're correct. Um, and we all uh, showed in 2017 that there's a factor of a 30 decrease in the constraint if you just put a 1,500 solar mass black hole at the center of one of these dwarfs. So that weakens the constraint of a factor of 30. And who knows what the mass is, if there is anything at all, like you said. Um, they also, all these assume that you have a delta function of intermediate mass modules. Now, if you have a broader distribution that extends to around the solar mass, whereas Cardall has shown, shown there's physical models which would lead to distribution of, of black holes, the spectrum, um, then the results can be um, completely invalidated because they act as a thermal sink. And then I won't go into these because I wanted to talk briefly in, in the last five minutes about uh, some things, but I just wanted to point out, if you go back to these features of null bias, and you look at these constraints, I mean, it really is checking off all these features. And so I think it's worth uh, investigating further. And the way that we've decided to, to investigate it is just one, except that there are black holes in this mass range. And you can question some of these. Some of these are extremely secure. Uh, some others less so. But we know that there are black holes in this mass range. And then, so rather than dealing with an array of astrophysics and playing systematics whack-a-mole, uh, we decided that just go with the most direct way of constraining. So the fewest degrees of separation of constraining this parameter space, and that can be done by extending the existing macho mass constraints. And so, again, we set up a project with the radical goal of confirming or rejecting the intermediate mass machos as a majority of dark matter but with the conservative goal of making the first direct measurement of, of some aspects of the mass spectrum of black holes in our own Milky Way. <laughs> so just briefly, why is this possible? And why did existing uh, microlensing surveys stop at 10 solar masses? Well, microlensing is really just a form of strong gravitational lensing, where you've got a source, light gets deflected, you see two images. Uh, but the difference is, is that the separation of those two images on the plane of the sky is very small relative to your imaging resolution. And so what you tend to observe is you observe as a function of time. So if you're looking in the black hole observer frame, you have a source star passing in the background, this red object. You see two images shown in blue. And since you can't resolve them, what you see, though, is the magnification, so the photometric brightening of that source star as a function of time. Now, the characteristic width of this brightening 
um, is set by the Einstein crossing time, right? The time for the source to cross the Einstein radius, um, Einstein diameter. And as you go to intermediate mass black holes, you see that that characteristic time scale can be on the order of years to, to decade. And since previous surveys said that, well, the number of expected events is a function of the number of mon monitored uh, source stars, the time scale of the survey divided by the time scale of the lensing event, right? Because if your time scale of your survey is shorter than the lensing event, you don't expect to see the, the An important aspect of this, though, is that this uh, optical depth is, is mass independent. So uh, that cancels out. And I can talk about that in more detail if you want. So the only place that mass is coming into play is in the time scale of the lensing event. Now, there's an interesting phenomenon for these long duration events. And the fact is, is that you've got the source star and you've got a black hole. And what's happening is as Earth is going around and observing the source star, you have changes in the geometry, which leads to a parallax effect. So you get these parallactic wiggles on top of your uh, that uh, photometric brightening curve that I showed. And the nice thing about this is that the period of this is set entirely by the period of Earth around the sun, which is a known parameter. This was first observed in 1995 during the Matra survey, this parallactic lensing effect. It's since been observed in the Yogo project, and some dramatic cases there. But the key thing here is that even on the time scale of six months, you can have um, a very characteristic and unique signature, for the most part unique. And so then, in this equation, the number of events, actually, this goes from tens of years now to six months. Actually, two years because you want to have, um, you want to see the repeatability. And as with all great ideas, I mean, I thought I was quite clever uh, whenever I realized this, but as with all great ideas, someone thought of it uh, <laughs> decades ago. Just pretty much what Andy called the micro lensing. Yes. <laughs> the exactly. idea he, he wrote in the 1990s. So most of my good ideas have either been thought of by now Andy Gould, Tony Tyson, and uh, Gary Bernstein. So I, I, <laughs> this will, at least I'm repeating uh, some pretty, pretty bright fellows. And so this kind of requires detection in 10 dimensions. Um, I want to save time for, for questions, so I'm just going to go through this and say there's prospects for doing this with LSST. Uh, you can detect this. Here's a simulated light curve using OPSEM data from LSST. You can have a booming significance, even if you take out the primary lensing signal and just look at the parallax of the lensing signal. For LSST, you can have a, um, a very strong detection. Similarly, for W first, and then this is really cool. I don't have time to go into it, but if anyone wants to talk about it, you can also have astrometric microlensing. And on this, I just wanted to, and this can break a degeneracy with the mass uh, distance relationship. But since this is a GMT place here, I just wanted to point out one thing that I'm very excited about. And this is the fact that with future adaptive optics resolution, with GMT and several other telescopes like that, and in this intermediate mass range, if you look at the Einstein crossing time, or how far these objects are separated, and you look at the resolution, so these black curves show the resolution of the given telescopes with adaptive optics or just from space, they can resolve the multiple images of anything below the black curve. And so if you look at GMT here, it can start to resolve 10 solar mass and above microlensing events. And so this can give you precise mass measurements of Free floating black holes or binary black holes and our own Milky Way. And so this is something I'm extremely excited about, coupled with LSST's capability of finding these objects, plus GMT follow-up. It really is going to introduce a new regime of, of dark matter and, and just black hole science in general. And so the other thing I like about the project is you've got all of these independent measurements. Um, and so it really helps you prevent uh, and avoid some bias that's typical. And so, just in summary, keep an eye out for these features of null bias. Um, they're there. I've seen it now in two fields, and those are the only ones that I'm 
very familiar with, so I'm sure that they're prevalent elsewhere. And, and just think, are there areas in your field where no bias might exist, where scientific progress might be um, being retarded? Thank you. Yeah, so actually we want to do two. So we want to do the Magellanic Clouds. Um, and those are nice because they look out of the plane of the Milky Way. But we also want to look at the uh, galactic bulge. And so there's, one, the optical depth is larger towards the galactic bulge. You expect more events. But also because, again, this radical plus conservative science, right? So uh, there's a good possibility that black holes don't make up an appreciable fraction of dark matter. And so we want to be able to accomplish all the other stellar remnant black hole science, which you expect to find more of those black holes looking towards the bulge and along the, the plane. However, um, if dark matter, if black holes really do make up dark matter, then you expect to see uh, something different. You still expect to see events as you look towards the Magellan. So again, it's always just about, um, one, maximizing uh, chances of, of detection where you look to these dense environments, but also mitigating the systematics and, and trying to break the generosities between two different hypotheses. There was a follow-up to the Macho Project called Super Macho. It was basically a little published. The first steps was in charge, but I was in part of that group. Oh, were you? Okay. And the problem with the Magellanic Clouds, or with this using the Magellanic Clouds, is that when you do the experiment, you actually learn a lot about the structure of the Magellanic Clouds. And you have to take that into account when doing this experiment. You have to have a very detailed idea of what the disk distribution of stars and magnetic clouds are, and what possible black holes there are not those big clouds also. You take that out of whatever signal that you're trying to measure. That's right, that's absolutely right. So yeah, we've I've been talking with Chris and then also we've got Tim Axelrod who was on the original Macho project and said which has been invaluable in, in understanding, yeah, you've got the streams, right? So you've got the I, I always assumed that the Magellanic Clouds were just two isolated objects. I didn't realize how much you had one in front of the other and how much background. And so yes, lensing by the Magellanic Clouds is also an issue. And then self-lensing. One thing that can, can help us out to some degree is that um, this is really an issue whenever you're dealing with, with smaller microlensing events or smaller mass microlensing events. With these intermediate mass black holes, they're uh, they're so massive that if it is a star, you expect to see that, you expect to see the wind star. It's hard to have a 10 to 100 solar mass star um, not show up. It's a, a very good point. Yeah. So, actually, like, Herb's like, is also Steve on a regular sample? So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I did not, uh, okay. so yeah, so this. I didn't have time to go into it, but if you want, I gave a talk, which I think was also recorded at Astro 2020, where, um, so this, this light curve is from OPSIM. So this is the sampling of a light curve from OPSIM, uh, which is the LSST operation simulator, and it shows, it says when and what field their nuclear patch of the sky is going to be hit. But that was from around here, part of the YFAST deep survey. But really, again, to Mac to maximize the chance of a microlensing event, uh, you want to be observing in the galactic plane where you have a lot of density, or the south celestial pole where you've got the Magellanic clouds. If you look here, the current LSST operation simulation, it surveys this patch of the sky about a tenth as much as this, and it finishes all of those observations within the first year. So this is terrible for this long time scale microlensing event, especially this parallax where you want to look for this, um, this six month or yearly period, right? And so what LSST is doing right now is they're about to have a call for mini surveys or specialized surveys. And, and so we plan on submitting one of these where it'll be uh, a survey of the galactic bulge and then also the eventual the clouds, but spread out the cadence over that 10 year period. But yeah, if, if done as currently planned, you'll lose all this science. So, but we're catching it early enough that I think
remedy it with little cost to the actual project. Excellent question. Uh, yeah. Speaking of being pedantic, um, so you're comparing how um, positive results get scrutinized more than no results, and you brought the upper experiment as an example. I feel like that's not a good example. Uh, the reason why upper experiment got so much um, attention was that it was an extraordinary claim. Um, just like the ether, which got scrutinized, um, supersymmetry gets scrutinized all the time, or transition quarks got scrutinized, you know, they were claims that had been ruled out by weak precision measurements, and then there was a paper that showed that it was wrong, and got 500 citations. Um, whereas there's all sorts of positive results at the LHC, all these hadrons. People are like, meh, it's just QCD magic, who cares? We know these mesons exist, and nobody has scrutinized them. So I feel like it's. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, you, uh, you're correct. I mean, if it's a false positive that's not very exciting, then yeah, it doesn't garner much attention. So I'll have to, I'll have to update my slides. Thank you. I was hoping that there would be points like this so that I, uh, I can make this better the second time I get it. Thank you. Should I take one more quick question? So like, sure. in 20, 2004, self-random dark matter was like, so, yeah, it was. So, but like, what if like for some, you know, replace self-interacting dark matter with warm dark matter, which is a little bit less, a little bit more quote unquote mainstream. Like, how would you think the analysis would have been changed? Would they have been more willing to easily exclude this, or I mean, is, is there some like, is there some spectrum here, in which you know, the theory, that where the theory lies, like uh, how how hard it gets, you know, easily discredited. I, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, um, there must be some continuum. This is already too hand wavy as it is, and so I, I dare, dare not try to quantify. But I think you're right. I mean, it's all just really this comes down to um, the fallibility of humans. And, right, and, well, I think that's actually a group. Yeah. <laughs> that's a perfect note. <laughs> uh, speaker on. So uh, thank Will again. For